Kevin, uh, you here? Yes, I'm just waiting for it to start. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, it is a pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Or Duncoman. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Or Duncoman. So Or is a professor in the University of uh, Haifa, is a well-known uh, researcher in the field of uh, symmetric uh, key cryptography and has uh, notable uh, results in uh, cryptanalysis, uh, like the introducing the dissection technique, which uh, received the best paper award uh, in crypto 2012, um, or is uh, also published important uh, results in the cryptanalysis uh, uh, of uh, uh, notable crypto systems uh, like uh, Kasumi uh, that is used in uh, GSM and uh, published important techniques that are uh, used in the well-known attacks, uh, actually the best known attacks today uh, on uh, the AES. Um, in addition, uh, OR also works in uh, privacy uh, preserving technologies and uh, in particular uh, in biometrics. Uh, so OR uh, has also uh, made a significant uh, contribution to the IACR uh, community. He was a general chair of Eurocrypt 2018 and the program chair of uh, FSC 2009. And uh, now notably, of course, uh, he is program chair of uh, one of the program chairs of uh, Eurocrypt uh, 2022, which is uh, coming up in a few months. Um, so uh, today or, uh, we'll uh, talk about uh, optimizing uh, cryptanalysis uh, for uh, fun and resource fit, and I'm uh, really looking forward to his talk. So, or go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Kevin, can you hear me? Let's see, let's assume it's yes. okay. Good. So uh, I would like to apologize in advance. The title, is, the title is somewhat misleading. We're not going to discuss resource fit. Because cryptanalysis is fun. I think it's sufficient for us as academics to just have fun and break stuff. Um, so go, going very quickly on what I'm going to discuss today, I'm going to give a very short introduction and then how to reduce data in cryptanalytic attacks and then a bit of how to reduce memory. And if time will permit, we will do conclusions and hopefully some questions and answers. Um, so let's start. Uh, if you look at what we're doing at the end, we're trying to break schemes. And while most of what I'm saying is going to be focused through the lenses of people working on block cipher cryptanalysis, it's very easy to um, generalize it to, for stream ciphers cryptanalysis or hash functions cryptanalysis or message authentication. So that we have lots of, type, lot, lots of types of cryptanalysis, but the thing there are multiple events that we're trying to do in this cryptanalysis for uh, events, which we call usually fast software encryption, like trying to break block ciphers. And there are even some events inside block ciphers, trying to break lightweight ciphers, trying to break white block ciphers, tweakable block ciphers, regular block ciphers. Somehow the regular doesn't fit anywhere. In stream ciphers, we're trying to break NLFSRs and software oriented and many others. The same goes for hash functions. And there are also different styles. So when we try to break ciphers or schemes, either you use the known plain text or the chosen plain text or the adaptive chosen plain text, we have different styles. So we have this wonderful Olympics and we are writing papers trying to break various schemes hopefully trying to make impact on real world or have, having fun, one of the two. Um, the problem is that sometimes when you try to implement these attacks, you reach a point where you understand that something is wrong in the way we're working to some extent. And I'm not going to criticize the community. I know, I know that I'm also responsible for papers uh, trying to break uh, a scheme that has 512 bit keys using two to the 508 time and two to the 162 data. And I don't even remember how much memory. So obviously this is not the best attack we can think of, but it was accepted. Now, just like in the regular Olympics, we have a motto which says faster, fewer queries and smaller memory. This is what we're trying to do. Um, actually, we have small update to this. Actually, we also want longer, which is more rounds. and Accurate, I'm terribly sorry. I'm sure there is a better English word, 
um, because sometimes we miss in the analysis. So we also want a somewhat more accurate analysis. And here comes the question. Now assume that you have one final slot for a conference and you have two papers, one of them using two to the 40 chosen plain text and one of them using two to the 60 non plain text. And you try to figure out which of the two attacks is more relevant or more practical or more interesting. The answer is very hard to tell. Uh, the same goes for memory. For example, if you discuss uh, attacks, you can find attacks that use two to the 30 memory. All of it must reside in a level one cache. I'm terribly sorry if you're not following hardware design. I think that in cryptographic audience, I shouldn't explain too much about how the memory works. Otherwise there is a long line of cache side channel attacks that you're missing on. But if you compare a very fast memory compared to an attack which uses significantly more memory, but this memory can be stored on hard drives. We, we cannot really compare these two, especially when you try to think of impact. How do we make, how do we measure which of the two papers is actually a more devastating against devastating attack, which has a greater impact uh, on uh, the security of the, of the schemes that we study. And I'm completely disregarding the quantum Olympics that uh, Maria Naya Placencia started, all these quantum attacks and all these sort of things where, first of all, we need a quantum computer, but then uh, everybody's a winner until somebody measures that. So here's a famous slide. I don't know many, how many of you know, uh, this is Don Coppersmith uh, talking at Crypto 2000. And in his talk, he made the following claim that two to the 56 uh, is actually not larger than two to the 47. Now, Don is a very smart person. The fact that I'm actually attesting to Don's capabilities is like, sort of like, I know, me saying, oh, Leonardo DiCaprio is a handsome guy and knows how to play on screen. It's out of my league. However, his claim, which I think is quite correct, is that two to the 56 uh, time complexity in my own garage is significantly better than collecting two to the 47 chosen paintings for differential cryptanalysis. So if you think of DES, data encryption standard, you can either break it using exhaustive key search or using differential cryptanalysis or linear cryptanalysis or any of the other techniques around, but they demand a huge amount of data. So at the end, when we're trying to assess the impact of the attacks, I think that even though it seems like most of the time we're spending on reducing time complexity, at the end, the data complexity and the memory complexities, depending on the scenario you have in mind, are actually the bottlenecks of your attack. If you're trying to make an impact, I would urge you to try and optimize these two metrics, uh, especially Again, if you have a, a mode in your mind that you're trying to uh, implement an attack and think of, for example, uh, Matsui's linear cryptanalysis, which was introduced in 93, 94, he made an attack, which was, he actually implemented the attack using many CPUs. Of course, they knew the key in advance and they encrypted all the data. He collected all the data from many CPUs, but then he was able to run the attack in practice in 94. And the attack takes two to the 43 data and time but the data is the prohibitive factor. And the same goes for memory. When we try to implement various analytic attacks, we usually find ourselves with bumping our heads towards the memory complexity, because even though we all know that we can easily do two to the 40 or two to the 50 memory, especially in the papers, it's easy to write two to the 50 memory. When you try to implement it, it actually becomes an engineering problem, which as cryptographers, I think we're trying to avoid too much. So what are the different type of cryptanalytic attacks? The first one are the generic attacks. They work always. They don't depend on the internal description. Of course, you have the algebraic attacks and you can of course uh, use various, I'm, I'm using algebraic in the broader sense, starting from set solvers and algebraics and Excel and Grubner base and XSL and SAT solving and MILP and all of that. We have the statistical attacks and it's on purpose, the black sheep of the family. Um, all differential, linear, and all that sort of stuff. We have the structural attacks, uh, for example, on merkel damgard hash functions like Antoine's, uh, Antoine Jou's multi-collision attacks. And of course, we have the slide-related key. And as I mentioned before, I terribly saw in front of all the people doing symmetric uh, stream cipher cryptanalysis. Of course, we needed a few more rings for covering those, but there are only five continents, apparently. Um, so here's a concrete example that actually arose in one of the papers. We had two attacks. The first one had two to the 16 known plaintext 
And the time complexity was equivalent to two to the 44.5 encryptions and used three megabytes of RAM. And the second one had two to the 16 chosen plain text, which is certainly worse than a, a non plain text. The model is of course harder. The time complexity was the same, two to the, the 44.5 encryptions and the memory consumption was two megabytes. Now, actually, if you look very careful, carefully at the analysis, it's not exactly the same running time. This running time is faster by a factor of two to, two to the power 0 0.002. So you need three decimal digits in the, it's, it's two to the 44.5. Which of the two attack, attacks is better? It's an interactive talk. So those in favor of the non plaintext attack, raise your hands. Those of you in favor of the chosen plaintext attack, raise your hands. And of course, this is a trick question because in our attack, the non plaintext variant using the same amount of time needed 500 CPU days versus only 218 CPU days for the chosen plaintext because the chosen plaintext allowed us to have a structure in the way we accessed memory. It's not that there was a problem storing three megabytes of RAM, it's just that you had structure in the way you access memory and therefore in the implementation, it was almost twice as fast, slightly more than twice as fast. Uh, it's a magic. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that we all need to now stop what we're doing and then learn how computers work or how to optimize code, uh, but we should keep this in mind that actually looking only at the figures themselves is a bit hard to tell and uh, this is a paper, of course, with uh, Sebastian Indestich et al. from Eurocrypt 08. So let's go for a second how to reduce the data complexity because usually the prohibitive factor, if you have the model in mind that you're trying to collect as little as data as possible just to make Don happy, um, how to reduce the data complexity. So the two most known statistical attacks are differential and linear cryptanalysis. I'm not going to cover them uh, now. We don't have the time and hopefully everybody knows at least by name what they're doing. Uh, give or take uh, differential cryptanalysis by BM and Shamir takes differentials, which are input output pairs, which are correlated with very high probability. And then you use it for distinguishing using about one over P pairs. And you can use it for key recovery and some other th techniques and other things as well. Linear cryptanalysis by Matsui, again, you find approximations. So, so you have input mask, input bits, which are related somehow to output bits. There is some high bias, epsilon, and you're trying to distinguish the scheme, you need about one over epsilon squared plaintexts, and you can also use it for key recovery, you can do some other things. So these are the two tools that we're working with when we're working in, with block cipher. So the question is how to reduce the data complexity of these two tools. So because we don't know how to reduce the data complexity, there are actually tools to prevent us from using them. So for example, uh, the early works of uh, Kaiser and Lars uh, show that you can achieve security against these techniques by just making sure there are no high probability differentials for approximations. So for example, for three round phase field, you use the X to the power of three S blocks. This is the orig original paper from 92, which has very good differential properties. And then you can prove that there is no good differential characteristic going through the entire scheme with probability higher than some bound. And then, of course, we have the wide trail, uh, wide trail strategy by uh, Johan and Vincent that showed that you can activate many S boxes and then everybody should be happy because the probability of the differential is related to the number of active S boxes. And therefore, uh, it's very hard to break the schemes. And, and there, are another, there is a the decorrelation theory by Serge that showed that you can make sure that the probability, the average probability of a differential or a linear approximation when it's taken over all the keys can be as low as you as you want or low to the point of being random. Uh, and we have these techniques to protect us against the cryptanalytic attacks. And they make sure that the probabilities that you're working with are as high as possible. Uh, sorry, are as low as possible, making the data complexity as high as possible. So because we have lower probabilities, that means more data and we want to reduce the data. So the question is how to counter these uh, techniques. And to some extent, you have to remember that all these techniques still allow for short properties to exist. It's very hard to have a full resistance to differential cryptanalysis or linear cryptanalysis after one round. So we need to find ways to actually uh, use the complexity, the, the fact that there are short properties 
rather than long ones. And actually there are some works doing that. Uh, very, very early uh, differential linear cryptanalysis was introduced by Langford and Hellman, and they combined the differential part with an approximation, with a linear approximation. Um, later on, uh, Wagner introduced the boomerang attack. We heard about it yesterday. I'm going to discuss it in a bit more details. So you can combine two different uh, differentials. There is even differential by linear attack, actually by linear cryptanalysis by Coltois from crypto 2004 uh, is a very nice tool against facial ciphers, but you can combine it, of course, with differential cryptanalysis. And there is the higher order differential linear attack, which also has a different name, square nonlinear by Shin et al. Uh, the boomerang linear attack. And of course, today we have other tools, for example, the rotational cryptanalysis or the invariant subspace, which try to, to go around the problem. Like we're using something which is different than counting the number of active S boxes. So if you have, if you try to look at rotations, active S boxes were not really well defined in that aspect, as the same goes for invariant subspaces. And this is how we're trying to attack modern schemes. Now, let's look at the boomerang attack at a closer look. So it was introduced by Wagner actually in FSC 99. And we know that there are two short, good differentials. Alpha goes to beta and gamma goes to delta. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll do it with slides. So you start with a pair of plain texts, P1 and P2, and they have an input difference uh, alpha. And then you partially encrypt it through the first part of the cipher. So you hope to get here a difference back. Now, the encryption continues. Of course, I can't tell you anything about the probability of what's going on here, because if I could, could have told you something about the probability, that means that I had a differential characteristic going from the beginning till the end, and I don't have such a thing. Luckily for me, I have a second characteristic, gamma goes, uh, second differential, sorry, gamma goes to delta. So we can XOR delta into C2 and get a new ciphertext. And when you decrypt it with good probability, you're going to get gamma here. And you're going to get gamma here if you do the same with C1 that becomes C3 and you get gamma here. Gamma difference, beta difference, gamma difference. That means that you have a beta difference here. And if you're working with differentials, not with truncated differentials, that means that it's very easy to see that this goes back to alpha with very high probability as well. And if you do look and assume that everything is independent and everything works well, then the probability of this entire mess is P squared Q squared. Probability of the first differential squared and the second differential squared. And they exist. So if, if you think for, for a second on AES, we know that there are no good four round differential characteristics for AES with probability higher than two to the minus 150. And there's actually works showing that there are no differentials with probability higher than two to the minus 100. But you can easily build boomerangs based on two round characteristics. Two round characteristics we can do with probability, probability two to the minus 30. So there is a trivial boomerang with probability two to the minus 120 for four rounds, even without using the various tricks that exist in boomerangs. And actually, uh, Alex Biryokov has a very nice paper about using boomerang attacks against AES uh, from the fourth AES workshop that he succeeds to break, uh, I think, up to six rounds using boomerang attacks. And this is something that you would not expect using differential cryptanalysis. Now, at the end, the quality of the attacks rely heavily on the quality of the differentials and the approximations that we're using. So if you have better differentials or better approximations, you're going to get better results, obviously. So let's try to find um, good properties. Now, the early works, and usually we don't read them, already suggested various insights on how to find those. Uh, both the original work on differential and Matsui's algorithm um, from his uh, 94 paper about the order, the order of the S-boxes in DES. Actually, what uh, Mitsuru suggested was, oh, let's do a BFS of all the possible differentials and trim the tree of possibilities when we get something which is not very useful. Later on, people uh, used similar ideas, not necessarily the same algorithm, for example, for uh, byte-oriented schemes. Uh, Biryokov and Nikolic had some, uh, Biryokov and Nikolic had some works on that. And later on, some, some of the attacks against AES in the related key and the related sub-key models are stemming actually from these works. Uh, of course, for the ARX ones, we also see it both in uh, hash function cryptanalysis, the Kanier and Rechberger from 2006 had the tools for finding differential, generalized differentials and taking into consideration the properties of the ARX schemes. And later on, there were some many works by uh, Biroyokov and, Be and uh, Veselin, Alex and Veselin, and many others 
are working on that. Now, the thing is that these tools are usually very cipher specific, very scheme specific. Now, of course, you can take the scheme and, then the, and rewrite it in such a way that you could, you could use these things. It's just that it's very hard. Uh, and these tools were not very friendly, even though they exist. I mean, for example, recently people put their codes online, so you can try and take some of Vesselin's code and use it. It works, but if you try to change the cipher, it takes time to understand where to plug in things. Um, and the thing is that most of these tools are also uh, are unavailable. If you look at the early works, everything was kept secret or not secret on purpose, but just, you know, that we used to have these sort of uh, export restrictions on uh, cryptography and cryptanalysis. So if somebody asks you for a code and you don't want to send the code, either because it's really messy or uh, well, really messy, you just say, I'm terribly sorry, export restriction, Vasana arrangement, uh, I cannot send you a cryptanalytic code. Um, but today people put more stuff on GitHub, so it's, it's less of an issue. So now we have this new era where people are using mixed integer linear programming uh, or other tools like SAT solving or constraint programming. And the idea is that at the beginning, people used MILP as a way to prove that there are no good differential characteristics or linear approximations. And later uh, they were used actually to, to find these properties. So now all you need to do is to write your scheme in MILP model, you fire up, one of the MILP solvers or the SAT solvers or the constraint. Everybody has their own favorite tool. And then you let it run. And at the end of the process, you say, oh, there is no differential characteristic. Or by the way, here's the best differential characteristic that was found. Now, uh, and, and later it, it, it was also, of course, uh, generalized to boomerangs and divisions. And you can probably find many works, including we saw yesterday, for example, boomerangs on skinny. So you just fire up the MILP model and you find new boomerangs. Okay, you need some domain specific knowledge of the problem, but you don't really need to understand the scheme, right? You just need to implement it in the model. Um, and of course the tools are widely available, so everybody are happier, but there is a problem with the bottom up approach. The thing is when you build the characteristics and the approximations and the boomerangs and everything bottom up, maybe besides the visions, but it's slightly different, you need to assume things happen independently between the rounds. So we heard yesterday, for example, in the case of Skinny that they worked very hard on putting everything inside the model. But then at the end, they needed to assume that there are some things that behave well enough, meaning that the probability of the differential characteristic the first round is independent of the second round or is independent of the third round. This Markovian cipher assumption that we assume most of the time, we understand that it's actually a very delicate assumption. There are some works uh, trying to figure out whether the assumption holds or not. Uh, to some extent, this reminds me of the works of the early ages of the cryptanalysis, proving that death is not a group. I don't know how many of you read the paper. You know that death is not a group, right? You read the paper? No. no. That's okay, there is a paper. Um, so you need to assume there is independence because otherwise the tools will not work. And I'm putting aside for a second hash functions because in hash functions, we rely on the dependency and we're using it because there, there we're using the correct differentials that capture the information and the, many of uh, Wang's attack against MD5 and SHA-1 are actually based on these dependencies. But when you're doing block cipher cryptanalysis or stream cipher cryptanalysis, you assume that the events are independent. But then you measure it and you get sometimes good results, sometimes bad results, sometimes you have boomerangs that don't return. And we need to solve it somehow. Um, so I, I would like to mention that besides the probability estimation of these tools, you also need, they don't really, they, they're incapable of saying whether the actual property that they found is feasible. It might be that there is some transition which cannot happen. And because they look at the problem locally, they don't see global connections. Again, putting aside for a second hash functions where well, you can do that, but most of the time you cannot do that. And even if you're using tools like BCTs or DLCTs to reduce some of the fancier in the dependency, so in the transition between one side of the boomerang to the other side or for one side of the linear differential linear approximation to the other side, there are still internal or local dependencies between rounds in the differential which is not really handled by these tools. And especially 
computing them and finding them is also not a trivial um, task. Okay, so here's a, diff here's a different approach, and this is a paper from 2015 uh, by Itai, myself, Adi, and uh, Masha Gutman. And here's the idea is that instead of working with bottom, uh, bottom up, we're going to do it top down. And instead of you know, trying to find the best characteristic, let's just sample the difference distribution table or the linear approximation table and hope that good things will come out. So actually, the paper discusses mostly different distribution tables, um, but some of the ideas may be applicable to linear approximation tables. So what we did, first of all, we showed how to find iterative differential characteristics in time order of two to the n, then finding low Hemingway differentials, and then finding differentials in sort of like meeting the middle approach. And this is experimentally finding uh, differential differentials or differential characteristics, depending on which of the three contributions. And the idea there is, again, instead of thinking of the problem like, oh, now I have to write everything from scratch. No, there is a simple uh, algorithm. You just let it run and everybody should be happy. So let's start the difference distribution table. Most, most of you know, you can construct it in time two to the two N. I'm using N as the block size and later on as the key size. If we don't have time to do both uh, block size and key size different, and we don't have the data for sure. Um, so to compute the row or, or column of the different distribution table, you can do it very easily in time two to the N and memory two to the N, or you can do it memory less if you uh, do some tricks there. Now, at the end, if you look for DS or you look of many of the schemes that we're breaking at the end, most of the time, the best characteristics are either iterative or very close to iterative. So I'm going to discuss how to find iterative ones. Finding something which is close to iterative is also can be done very using uh, simple uh, ideas like that. So what we're trying to find is to look at the different distribution table instead of looking at the row or the column, trying to capture the diagonal. Now. I will let you think for a second how to compute the difference distribution table of the diagonal. Usually the way we compute the row for each pair with input difference alpha, we check what are the output differences. Now I'm trying to do a diagonal. So I need to look at pairs with different inputs and different outputs. It's, it's a bit more complicated when you think about it. Luckily for us, there is a very simple algorithm. For all x's, you just compute f of x and you store in the table x, x or f of x, input x or output. And of course you need also to store the inputs, but this is for the analysis part. And you find collisions in this table and such a collision, note that if x, x or f, x is y, x or f, y, that means that x, x or y is f, x, x or f, y. So I can find the same input difference as the output difference for a very uh, small price. It's just two to the n time and two to the n memory. And now like, we can easily find good uh, iterative differential characteristics. Okay. Questions so far? Okay. So here's a different approach and we call it beans in the middle. So usually you have some idea how the input difference or what good output differences will look like. So if you're discussing ARX schemes, it's usually going to be something which is very light. Right, it's not going to be something with many bits which are active because, well, when it goes through the ARX, it's probably going to cause a lot of havoc and reduce probability. So let's assume that I'm giving you an input output difference and I'm telling you, please find the probability of the differential going from the input to the output. So the simplest task, the simplest algorithm, you take many pairs with the input difference, you check how many of them satisfy the output difference and everybody are happy. But there is a better algorithm and the idea is you take less pairs. You still take many pairs, but significantly fewer pairs with the given input difference and you partially encrypt them. So you store the output differences. You go from the top and you encrypt them and you look at the output differences after a few rounds. Then you take the output difference. You take multiple pairs with this output difference and you go backwards and you check the differences coming back. And then if there is a match in the differences, you have a differential characteristic, which is now you can say or, but you said that there are not going to be independence assumptions and because there is no relation between the input and the output, you add here some dependency, right? We have some independency assumptions for the analysis to work. However, now I don't need to try if the probability of the differential is P, I don't need to try one over P pairs, I can use significantly less. So if the characteristic or the differential 
is distributed relatively evenly over the rounds, you can do it with about one, one over square root p from the top and one over square root of p from the bottom and, and try to meet in the middle. And again, there is a small independence assumption on the transition, but not on the, these, the first part and the second part because we treat them as a black box. So the internal dependencies, I don't care. I just sample it globally and then the internal dependencies disappear. So this is a very uh, nice trick. The, the code I think is unavailable because, well, a Vassanar arrangement or something like that. So, okay. So now that we have the differential characteristics and we have the linear approximations, let's try to take them and make the, this, use them in a better way. And specifically, let's try to make the distinguisher work better. And for that, we can use various uh, ideas. And this is actually done in many works, and I'm just going to go over some of the techniques, and there are obviously many other techniques. So first one is how to transform a single right pair into many right pairs. This is a very useful tool, for example, in hash function cryptanalysis. If you remember Wang's attack on SHA-1, you find a pair that satisfy the first 20 rounds of the characteristic, you transform it into many pairs, and then, one of them will, you don't need to pay the probability of the first half, of the first 20 rounds. Uh, the same thing can be used also in block cipher cryptanalysis. I'm going to mention it very quickly there. Uh, sometimes we can identify sets of inputs for which the distinguisher works better. So we'll see that in a second as well. Sometimes we're going to use dependencies between various inputs. The, de the dependency that causes issues with the Markov cipher assumption and causes us problems when you try to evaluate things, we can use it to our advantage if we know where it is. And of course, sometimes we can even force the dependency to happen and then we're going to gain a lot. So here is the uh, way of transforming a single pair. Let's assume that you have a characteristic that delta zero going to delta L and the probability again under the Markov assumption, the Stochastic equivalence assumption. Um, US, there are actually two different assumptions, but under the Markov cipher assumption, uh, the probability is the multiplication of all the probabilities, and you need one over p uh, pairs in order to identify a, a pair that follows this characteristic. Now, this is a single pair. Sometimes I need many pairs. For example, in as I mentioned before, in hash function cryptanalysis, but also in block cipher cryptanalysis. Sometimes I want to take a single pair that satisfies the transition and generate many, many other friend pairs, which will have better properties or nicer properties. So this exists, for example, in some of the attacks we had on Kasumi. So once you find a pair, you can easily transform it into multiple pairs. Uh, it was used recently uh, by uh, Christoph and Gregor and several others in differential linear cryptanalysis. So they have a subspace of uh, they find one pair that satisfies the differential transition, and then they transform it into many pairs that satisfy the differential transition. And then for all of them, the differential linear property works uh, better. And there are several other works running around this idea. Uh, so here's the idea how it works. Let's assume that in the first round, there are bits which do not interfere with the differential transitions. What, what does it mean? That if you flip the bit, they don't go into the active S boxes or they go into the active S-boxes, but they don't uh, operate on, they don't impact the transition itself. So if you take a pair that satisfies this characteristic and you flip those bits, you get another pair that satisfied exactly, well, at least the first round for free. So this, for example, can be used to increase your signal to noise ratio, because if this is a right pair, I can transform it into many other right pairs in a very low cost and, of course, the probability is higher, so I can use it to, to do other attacks. Uh, sometimes they're using, people are calling it neutral bits, like in BM and in 2005, and there are many names. For, the thing is that we as a community, and please don't take it the wrong way because I'm also doing this, we keep on inventing new names for exactly the same thing. So it's trying to find out all the, all the techniques, which are all the attacks you're using this thing, it's very hard because it's sometimes hidden in some, oh, step two of the attack, given a right pair, do the following. Oh. Um, here's another idea. Let's try to split the world. I know that everybody are talking about unification and we're all one, one race, et cetera. But at the end, sometimes people need their own 
space and they have their own differences. So instead of working with all the data, let's try to, to try and locate the data which is actually useful for us. And for example, the uh, partitioning crypt analysis by um, Harpus, why it's P? It's Harpus. Yeah. From 95, it said, let's take linear cryptanalysis and try to divide the world in such a way that if by any chance uh, there is some bit that you see outside, it is more likely to satisfy the differential or the linear transitions. So in this case, it was a linear transition that works, of course, using differential transition, especially in the context of, context of ARX. When you add things, you can say, oh, if this bit is equal to zero, then I know that there, gonna, there is not going to be any uh, carry chain. So I'm, the, the characteristic is going to be held with higher probability. Of course, you can also use it when you want the carry chain to happen. Uh, sometimes it depends on values that the adversary controls. For example, in the chosen plaintext attack by Knussen, uh, you can do, you can actually reduce the data complexity of linear cryptanalysis by making sure that there are many uh, plaintexts such that all of them satisfy some condition on the on the parity, and then you don't need to guess the key because you know already that all the plaintexts are satisfying something or not satisfying something. And of course, you can also do it on some key values or unknown values. This is very popular uh, in attacks on uh, authenticated encryption, especially against all these schemes that you introduce some difference and then you look, you try to see what happens, what's the bias of the differential linear approximation that you get there. And the idea is that there are sets for which indeed the probabilities are different. Now, usually we don't like that because this is ruining our assumption. But as I said, if we know in advance, we can divide the world accordingly and use it. And the thing is, um, in some cases, this allows us to attack schemes that earlier we couldn't do it. There is a wonderful example with respect to linear cryptanalysis, conditional linear cryptanalysis, where the probability of the linear approximation is zero. But if you divide the world into two halves, according to some bit, then the, the bias here is very high. The bias here is very high. It's just that they are the negation one of the other. So. You can get wonderful things like that. Another technique, and this is, a, again, I'm, I'm considering a differential transition. You have a differential characteristic going from delta one, one, delta one, two. I'm just breaking it into two halves, not necessarily equal, going to delta two, one, and delta two, one. Oh, this is delta two, two. So I think, think for, exact, uh, for a second, two columns of AES going to two columns of AES, and then you have the other two columns of AES going to the other two columns of AES. And let's assume that you succeeded to find such a pair that satisfy this transition, you can actually mix and match. So if I take the first half from the first plain text and the second half from the second plain text, these are new values. And I take the second half from the first uh, plain text and the first half from the second, uh, the second from the first and the first from the second, yeah. Uh, you get a new value and they also satisfy the transition because these are actually the same values. So this was used in uh, the yo, -yo attack uh, in 98. Uh, Bia Metal, and then uh, recently in the works that uh, Lorenzo has been doing about mixture, differ mixture differentials, actually, this is what they're doing. They're mixing values, and we know that the transitions happen because we assured that by using the dependency. So how we combine all of these, here is an example from our Europe 2020 uh, paper. Um, so if you try and do this with boomerangs, I remind you in boomerangs, you need to, you start with a pair of plaintext, you go down, you move back, you and the way you can, you can do things is like in Orpheus and the, um, you, I'm, I'm not even going in, even to try the name in Greek or in English because I have the names in Hebrew and translating Greek names back from Hebrew to English doesn't sound. But those of you who don't know the story for Orpheus, he went to Hades to save the soul of his uh, beloved one. And he was told, don't look back. And then of course he looked back and everything was lost. Um, so I'm trying to do the same with boomerangs because I'm, I'm sending the boomerang and then Sean Murphy showed that the boomerangs don't always return, which was not very nice of him. And this puts him in not a very good position, like he's responsible for Hades or something like that. Um, so how can we exploit that? And for that, we have the retracing boomerang attack. And the idea is as follows. Let's try to follow the footsteps we already walked through. So you walk on the beach and then you walk backwards on the beach on exactly the same uh, footsteps. And this ensures that you go back to exactly where you want to be. 
So think for a second, if this is the standard boomerang interpretation, alpha goes to beta, gamma goes to delta, let's assume that you have a secondary uh, division of the, of the second part into two halves. So the first one you have uh, gamma goes to some input on the left hand side mu L, on the right hand side mu R, and then they are outputted into delta L and delta R. So I'm just looking at what happens to two halves of the scheme. So what you can do, uh, actually you can mix and match. I take a plain text of, I take a pair of plain text, I encrypt them, and then I just mix and match. Now, if by any chance this pair satisfy the going backwards on one hand, on one of the characteristics, I know for sure that this pair is also going to do that. So I can assure you that either they work together or they're completely far away. This increases the probability of the, different, of the distinguisher and therefore the attack becomes faster because I need less data and I of course need, need less memory and everybody should be happy. Question so far? Now is the fun part because we can do something better. And this is as follows. Let's assume for a second that the left half, the, the one that is active for the sake of argument has a zero output difference. So let's assume that I could break the, the characteristic here. I could break it such that there will be there will be a zero input difference here and a zero output a zero difference here. No, I, yeah, and this means that actually the values there don't matter. You can do whatever value that you want there. Now, if this is the case, so I'm looking for pairs, and I'm looking for pairs such that the values are going to be equal. So I'm starting with C1 and C2, which are not related in the second part of the cipher. And I'm trying to find out whether they're going to have the same value in some place. And when this happens, I'm going to generate from them more C3 and C4. I'm just going to flip the bits there. But look, I told you that I'm going to reduce the data complexity. And what I'm doing, I'm starting with pairs of plain text. And even if they satisfy the differential, the first alpha goes to beta, I throw them away. We want to reduce the data, not increase the data. The thing is that actually this saves a lot depending on the probabilities of all the characteristics. Um, and when this happens, we get many characteristics, many pairs. And this is using, of course, with the idea of let's find many values that satisfy the characteristics. Now I can, the characteristic. Now I have many pairs, many friend pairs that I can use in order to find the boomerang. So I'm paying the probabilities completely, the, the game of probability is completely different. And actually you save a lot of uh, data complexity. And this is actually the best known attack on the up on the five round AES from last two, two last year clips. Uh, the data complexity is two to the 15 adaptive chosen plaintext and ciphertext. And it starts with take two to the eight pairs, encrypt them, and then throw the ones that you don't like. Um, I just want to connect uh, to, to slightly correct the, what uh, Itai said earlier. This is the best known attack on five round AES. The best known attacks on seven round AES are slightly different. Um, Okay, so far with data complexity, now let's try to save memory complexity. So we all remember the data, the Diffie and Hellman man in the mid, uh, meeting the middle attack. You have double encryption. So what you do, you build the table from one side, you decrypt from the other side, you perform it in the middle and everybody are happy and we can find the key in time two to the N and memory two to the N. Yes. Okay. So you all know this technique, and actually you can reduce the memory complexity. When you try to implement meeting the middle attack, uh, and when I tell this to my students, they say, oh, but the memory complexity is very large and memory complexity is very hard and implementing it's very hard. They have a lot of complaints, students these days. Um, but we need to reduce the, data, the memory complexity. So luckily for us, we can do it in a memoryless manner uh, because if you look at it, actually there are two functions here. The one goes from P to the center and to the middle and one going back from C to the uh, center. And memoryless collision finding can be done in time two to the n over two. We need two to the n of these collisions to know that we covered everything, but you can do it in two to the three n over two without any additional memory. So I remind, uh, I will remind you later how this works. And here is the four uh, encryption, and we all uh, know that by now that either you build a table from one side and you build and you approach it three times. So you guess two to the n. You build a table of two to the n values and you approach it two to the three n times, or you build a table in the center, so it's two to the two n from the top, two to the two n from the bottom, and everybody 
they should be happy, but we can do better. And this is the dissection attack, uh, a joint work with Itai and Nathan and Adi from Crypto 2012. So what we do, we start by guessing the value here in the, in the middle, and then we perform a meet in the middle attack here. Uh, we get two to the n candidates for the key. We, we then take the second plain text and we encrypt it here. We do the same in the second half. We do again a meet in the middle here. And what you get at the end is a meet in the middle attack in times two to the two n and memory two to the n. So we got the better memory and the same time complexity without increasing the memory complexity a lot. Of course, there are extensions of this idea and you can do the dissect seven to, uh, to one is like uh, seven, seven four one is uh, also useful for seven round encryption. And we can do many cool things, including incorporating the uh, parallel collision, collision search, which we'll discuss a bit later. So now let's go to the memoryless uh, case of double encryption. Uh, as I said, we're looking for a collision between two functions. We can do it without memory. And this is something that is very useful to remember when you design your algorithms, because many of the algorithms that at the end we're looking for collisions and collisions can be found memoryless by just uh, using Floyd's algorithm or Nivach algorithm or any of the memoryless collision finding algorithms. So if you take a random function f from n bits to n bits and you treat it as a directed graph, we're just looking for a node that has two edges going in at the same time. And this can be easily done uh, using the two fingers algorithm. Uh, you pick at random a starting point, you start moving forward once with a one pointer that goes one step at a time. The second pointer goes uh, two steps at a time until they meet together. And then you can find the collision using the lambda method. You just take the first pointer to the beginning and then you slowly move until you find the collision. So this is a way to do it memoryless. There is a slight uh, increase in the time complexity. Nivash, knows, Nivash know how to do it with only a small amount of memory and not so huge uh, increase in the time complexity. And we can use that. And actually we use it in several attacks uh, on Alred, for example, and recently uh, we also used it in some other attacks, again, trying to reduce the memory consumption. And it's not, it's not very costly. Time-wise, finding a collision with memory takes two to the n over two. Finding a collision without memory takes time two to the n over two. Uh, why not to use the memoryless variant? Now, sometimes you do have some memory and you can trade off between them. Uh, for example, in the case of the parallel collision search by Van Olshut. Um, so the idea is as follows. Uh, you store chains. So you start, you pick a point and you start walking forward until you reach a distinguished point and you store the distinguished point in the memory that you have. And the more memory, the easier it, it becomes. Of course, you can store very large memory and use very short chains. And there is some trade-offs going on. And if you want to find uh, C collisions in memory S, you can do it in time, which is roughly C two to the N over two over square root of S. And you can see the full analysis in Itai's paper from Eurocrypt 2020. So this is again a tool that tries to reduce the total memory consumption. And that's the thing. When we try to implement various attacks at the end, we hit ourselves usually not with the time complexity, but either with the memory complexity or with the data complexity. Now, data complexity, we try to reduce as much as possible. Memory complexity is a bit harder because there, there's also some different models of memory. Fast memory, slower memory, even slower memory, even even slower, slower memory. So trying to optimize for the actual attack is very complicated, but it should be done. So to conclude, first of all, if you have a cryptanalytic attack, implement, implement, and implement, because this is the only way to verify that all the randomness assumptions and all the independence assumptions actually work. Uh, this is a very uh, useful technique to actually understand where are the bottlenecks of the real attack. I mean, if you're trying to say, oh, my attack breaks this, uh, Let's go with, this is a Russian scheme. We broke the scheme. Uh, let's try and check whether it works. Uh, and when you implement it, actually you succeed. Of course, and I would like to suggest that if you happen to review a paper that says the attack takes time two to the 500, the comment, uh, have you tried to implement the attack is not useful to some extent, even though I understand what you're trying to say. So if, if you're the one behind the review I received on the two to the 508, Time paper. That's okay. I understand. I understand the point. Um, okay. The next uh, thing: try to reduce the memory. At the end, when you implement the attacks, 
the problem tends to be the memory. Usually, now again, if you have a model where you're trying to probe a, a box and you're trying to get data from a single box, the data complexity seems like the problematic one. But if you're assuming a model where you have uh, multiple devices and you're just collecting data, think for example of uh, Gaiton's paper, uh, Suite 32, where you collect a lot, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of data. The problem at the end was collecting a lot of data and then storing it, and then trying to sort it and finding. It's not a hard algorithm. It's just implementation-wise, it, it's a complicated thing. And of course, still try to reduce the data complexity so you will have better attacks. And finally, implement, implement, implement. And if if you can, please share your code so others could uh, use it. And of course. Uh, the real heroes of the talk is not me because I worked with many people. Some of them are sitting here and there and various places. So all I know is from because of them. Um, and I think that I have only one paper on, if you look at my DBLP, there is only one paper that I wrote alone. And this is a three page paper on how to compute BCTs on ePrint. It was never published in any conference. All the other papers are with other people. So I owe them a lot of, th of thanks. And they are the real, real people behind this talk. So thank you all. So, uh, or thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, so let me maybe start by a question. Uh, do you think that the designers should be should take uh, this into account? I mean, all the cost model, maybe propose some cost model and then uh, say that no attack in this cost model uh, should have cost uh, such and such, and this should be the security claim instead of just saying, you know, you cannot beat exhaustive search. Do you think that would be a valid uh, security claim? So, so this, this is a good question because some papers already use that. So some of the alpha reflection ciphers uh, have this sort of like, there is no attack such that the data times time is, better than some bound. Actually, it dates back to um, the Evan Mansour scheme, which had a security proof saying that the data times uh, time. But that's uh, a very simplistic model. It's a very simplistic model, but this was the very first uh, work. There, of course, the models that says, oh, you can take the memory chips and transform them into a exhaustive key search uh, mechanisms, and therefore the time times memory should be better. Yeah, but that's a generic attack. These are generic talking, attacks. Uh, like on AES, do you think so, that uh, the AES so, designer should then? Uh... So the answer is yes and no. If, if it's a logical bound, then I would say yes, in the sense of it, it's a legitimate claim. I would still prefer to see a cipher which has, a, which sustain the standard notion that we're using of the time complexity of the attack should be should be higher than exhaustive search, so the attack is invalid. Of course, in real life, at the end, uh, there is a. Uh, how do you go back? Uh, it's a little bit slightly uh, technologically incapable. Here. At the end, this this was said before. This is a legitimate concern if you're trying to design a cipher. On one end, on the other end, if you're sitting in a standardization body and somebody says, well, they broke the scheme, but only because we, we set the bar a bit lower than what other people have set the bar, I would say this is sort of shady thing. And I would rather have a higher bars than lower bars. But is it a legitimate one? Yes, it is a legitimate one. It just means that when you write the title, you cannot say I broke uh, the following scheme. I have an attack on the following scheme. So. If you're into linguistics and you know being a bit lawyerish with your security claims, yeah, you can do that. But I rather not, but it's a legitimate way. Okay, so uh, any other questions for Or? Yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Thanks a lot for that. Um, speaking of this implement, do you feel like the uh, community focused too much on the theoretic attempt that takes the last bit out and that most rounds are very academic in a way, and too little on those attacks that we can actually verify and track those because we know that they work? I, I, I think, think you need to repeat. I, I, so the question was whether we as a community are not doing our job by, <laughs> I'm sorry for the phrasing by uh, looking at 
only the attacks that break the maximum number of rounds and hard to implement because they're just reducing a small constant from the time complexity versus the ones that you can implement and check and verify. And I think the answer is that we should do both of them. So we should do both attacks that use little amount of data. And there are some papers I didn't mention about using low data complexity attacks on the AES, starting, starting from the basic claims of the algebraic cryptanalysis that said, oh, we can break uh, AES with a single plain text. And then later on, there were more standard uh, cryptanalytic results in this model. The same goes for a uh, reduced round AES. So the recent results of five round AES starting from the attacks by um, Lorenzo and Sunjun and uh, Christian, about five, I think it's, yeah, the five round uh, AES attacks. We need both of them because yes, again, we want ciphers which are secure, even if the adversary has the capabilities of two to the 127 rather than, then this shows that there's some impurity in the design or something that could have been done, be done better. Of course, from practical point of view, because some people are taking reduced round AES and are using it. So if you remember the AEZ uh, candidate for the authenticated encryption competition, it used reduced round AES. So we need to understand also the implications for reduced round version. So we need as a community to do both of them. One of them tells us what is the, I, I'm not going to say the real security because even the two to the 15 attack, it's adaptive chosen plain text and ciphertext attack. Okay, this is far from being something I would call practical in the sense of, oh, the, if the NSA has to break into my device, they're not going to use this attack to break five round AES, they're just going to uh, get the key from the site. That's a different issue. But if, you, if we try to understand the security, yes, we need also these sort of understandings of how the attacks look like, because they actually, these are where we, these are the places where we find new ideas. Like, I think I, I'm, I, I'm hoping that I will be proven wrong and the prophecy since the destruction of the temple uh, was given to fools. So I'm going to make a prophecy that I'm, I'm going to be very happy to, to, to be found out later that I was wrong, that standard cryptanalysis of AIS is not going to advance a lot in the next few years. But reduced round versions, yes, for sure. Because there are new ideas going there and there are lots of things that can be done. So we need both of them to, to have better research. Thanks for that. Uh, such a detailed talk, and it was really nice to have uh, this information. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm quite narrow to this particular field. I uh, just started working on it. Uh, but yeah, you started your talk with the CPU base and giving that uh, performance details that you should see here. My question is mostly related to the implementation side. So why not the GPU are being explored? So the advantages are like you can have the, uh, the, and the differentials in parallel, you can have rounds calculated independently, evaluated independently. Uh, and also if you want to uh, find out the pairs, uh, you can find out the pairs once you have a train from a lot, lot many, a large number of pairs uh, when you evaluate it. Now, these are the, like, uh, the advantages when we uh, talk about the GPU, but uh, in terms of security, what do you think? What can be the disadvantages or in terms of other parameters, what can be the disadvantages when you go on the, uh, on the implementation analysis or the tackles on the, on the GPUs? Okay, so the question in general is about, can we use GPUs to enhance at the end cryptanalysis? And, and first of all, we know, for example, Mark Stevens' attack on SHA-1 was implemented over GPUs but then he needed a very specific property from the, GP, from the GPUs. Now, something to remember, they're very good at doing single instruction on multiple data. And when you do collision finding, it's very useful because you start with spending pairs and work with them. Um, the problem when it comes to, let's say, cryptanalysis of block ciphers. So unless this is like a exhaustive key search or, some, or something like that, we need, the ability to work with a lot of data. And for that, usually GPUs are usually not the best candidates. And plus this is something that is not in the model. And if you really want to do cryptanalysis in real life, you need to factor in some factors that usually we in academia or in research, we don't care about. For example, the cost of the programmer, right? The cost of a PhD student is essentially zero. 
I, I'm a bit surprised people are laughing that the cost of a person is zero, but okay, let's, let, let's, let's continue with that. Um, and it takes time, more time and more proficiency in programming GPU code or FPGAs. We can, we can ask the same question about FPGAs. I'm not talking about ASICs. Uh, the EFF, when they needed ASIC uh, exhaustive key search machine, they had to go to Paul, Paul Kocher to, to design a, a scheme and a system. And it, it takes a lot of effort. And of course, writing the code in C or even in Python, you know, now you can just give a Python exercise. Uh, implement a memoryless collision finding. You give it as a Python uh, exercise for students, undergraduate students, and they do import uh, cryptanalytic something from the Python library and everybody are happy. Um, so it costs less. So the, the real mod, the, the real at the end, and I'm very sorry for the, this capitalist uh, statement at the end is the cost. We need to reduce the cost of cryptanalysis. Now we are academics, so we have incentives which work slightly differently. The cost model is slightly different. Uh, so this goes for GPU. It's going to be very hard to write good and efficient GPU code. It's going to be very costly, both in time and in uh, just procuring the hardware and procuring the knowledge of how to use this uh, GPU type. And of course, when the GPU changes, everything collapses. And thanks to our dear friends at uh, Ethereum, everybody are buying GPUs like crazy for mining and... Yeah, if, if we could have used the block the blockchain and slightly better for Kipnasis, that would have been great. Besides uh, Gaiton's talk about finding uh, uh, collisions, near, it was your talk at your crypt, but you exhort several uh, blocks from Chateau 56, yeah. So Gaiton, Ram, session. Ram session talk that showed that you can use it to find more, more bits which are equal to zero in the, but that's it. So the answer is yes, we need it. No, but it's very hard to do. So. Take it to each direction you want. Okay. Uh, do we maybe we have uh, one more time for one more quick question? Maybe from the online audience, if there is. Okay. So uh, let's uh, thank Or again for a very nice talk. We resume at uh, eleven forty five.